A tranquil looking flight over a BC mountain range, one that we have ice to thank for. The history of the Earth is pretty much written in the increase and retreat of ice. The features that we look at have been carved out by ice. You know, it's not like ice is a trivial thing in the history of our planet, and we just don't know what the world would be like without it. Inside the plane, science hard at work. We're able to monitor rates of change uh, in the ice, ice sheet itself. They're getting a bird's eye view of how global warming is impacting glacial melt and the rippling effect. The crew's pilot, Robin Stewart, has been flying over these same glaciers for years. They're so huge that I'm sure it's hard for many people to understand that they could disappear. Where are we headed? This is the Hakka UNBC Coastal Observatory. This is where you spend most of your time? Yeah, exactly. Essentially, this is my office. This is a laboratory with wings. Stephen Beffert works on the Airborne Coastal Observatory. So this is our spectrometer. Or His job is to operate the equipment on board that takes measurements of the ground below. This is a highly specialized plane. We basically have taken a Piper plane, gutted the whole thing, and put in our sensors specific for our projects that we want to get done here. Okay. And then go this is the laser here. We, we scan, we do a laser scan over all of our project areas uh, to make a 3D digital model. That's right, lasers on a plane. We're basically firing light pulses out of this box. As the light hits the ground and comes back, we can figure out how far that light has traveled. Once all the data is collected, we're shooting millions and millions of points. We can put all those points together to create a 3D digital model, a terrain model of whatever we're flying over. This quantifies what's on the ground as it lays. So topographical 3D mapping. They're used to map out a rapidly changing landscape, showing how extreme events like this year's heat dome in British Columbia have taken the ice away. The glaciers influence the weather. Even you know, flying an airplane over the glaciers, I can tell that. Especially on a hot day where there's ice underneath you, the air is sinking, and where the, uh, the air is over rock, which gets heated by the sun, is rising. It's hard without being a scientific expedition to really see it, because the seasonal variation is quite large. From the sky, it looks picturesque. But below the clouds, the aftermath of one climate disaster after another. After the heat dome came the fires, and after the fires came the floods. Extreme weather events in British Columbia are unfolding at a frantic pace, and that's what has scientists scrambling to assess each disaster and try to predict what perfect storm could happen next. We have lots of glaciers that are retreating rapidly due to climate change. For years, glaciologist Brian Menounis has been sounding the alarm on glacial loss. He's one of the scientists working to understand the data from Airborne Coastal Observatory and what it means for our future. So in British Columbia, we are blessed with many thousands of glaciers, over 15,000. We met him on a dike at the edge of Vancouver, the last stop as ice runoff makes its way to the open ocean. The tremendous amount of warm temperatures at that time would rapidly deplete uh, the mountain snowpack this particular event was quite severe in terms of its melt. There were a lot of unusual conditions that coincided collectively to bring us where we are today. And this year, it, it's been especially bad for our glaciers. It was not long after this conversation with Brian that BC was hit with a series of atmospheric rivers causing some of the worst flooding this province has ever seen. When we think about these extreme events, these are caused by climate change and they are we're not talking about a future scenario anymore. We're talking about climate change is here, it's real, and it's now. It's not just what these scientists are discovering, it's how they're sharing that information. What we do need in terms of preparing for future changes in climate is better and more rich geospatial data. And we need people to actually work with those data to make sensible decisions going forward both in terms of planning and preparing for the next hazard or the next disaster, but in some cases, dealing with the aftermath of when disaster strikes. So we can fly anywhere uh, down to 
back on board the science laboratory, that's exactly what scientists are trying to understand. What's next? Um, so we've got accurate records before the heat dome, accurate records after the heat dome. We can really see what that heat event uh, did to the glacier. A clear picture in quick time. Adding to the slow but steady work of government scientists, this team can track changes right after a disaster. One that we survey a ton of times um, called Place Glacier. It's just north of Pemberton. And one thing that's special about it is that they have survey data on that going back to um, probably the 1950s. I think, you know, people must have hiked up or something to get the data. But so then we've got a continuous record of what's going on with that glacier. In fact, Place Glacier has been continuously monitored since 1929. This year, melt is astonishing. It's our territory. It's our homeland. People like Edwin Bacati from the Lillooet Nation know this all too well. He was on the ground, living through that melt from Place Glacier. I was evacuated out of my house for a flood precaution, and we... We didn't even get moved back into our house and we were in fire season. It literally went from floods to fire. Edwin was one of many forced from his homes when the extreme heat last June rapidly melted the ice in the surrounding mountains, leading to widespread flooding. The glaciers in the last few years, they've changed so much that it doesn't matter which glacier you go and look at now, all you can see is gray rock. You don't see any ice almost anymore. And it concerns us what's to come of it when we lose, when we lose all the ice. What does that loss mean to you and to your culture and your people? It's not just First Nations people that are going to feel it. All people are going to feel it. The world is changing here. And, uh, you know, it's very concerning when we watch our neighboring communities burn to the ground in just a few minutes. You know, we have to be aware and we have to recognize that, you know, Mother Nature herself is going to retaliate against everything that's happened. And then, four months later, this happened. Look at this bridge. The intense atmospheric river pouring like a fire hose over southern BC for days. We checked in on Edwin again after the waters receded. How are you? He knows he's one of the lucky ones, able to return home. Through all this chaos, we're doing fine. Yeah. You, know, you talked about this feeling yeah. that something yeah. ominous is still to come. We certainly have changed the place and, uh, you know, over the years. And I think those impacts are coming back to bite us. And we need to change uh, our practices. And when you spend 200 hours in one summer flying over those impacts, you can't help but feel the loss. Have you ever heard of an astronaut who came back from space and did say, um, you know, what they, they, they all say, didn't say like, you know, people, people, this is the only planet we've got. I've seen it from up there. We have to preserve it. And yeah, you get up close and personal with the glaciers and the same thing. Well, we might not have all the answers right now and we can't stop the next disaster from happening, scientists will continue to search for clues one flight at a time. Johanna Wagstaff, CBC News, Vancouver.